hello and welcome everybody to another episode of Access to Perspectives Conversations. Here with me today, we have Joyce Wangari, who is a um, consultant psychologist and a research mentor with a strong focus and interest in diversity and disability inclusion, and especially on the nexus between deafness and mental health. She's, uh, she's just um, concluded her doctorate in psychology and clinical psychology at the United States International University, Africa in Nairobi, Kenya. And yeah, and we're very keen on hearing from her. And thank you so much for joining, Joyce. Um, thank about, you for yeah, having me. About your expertise, your findings, why you're so passionate about mental health and academia in particular, and also of course, um, how like about your work with including hearing impaired or deaf um, scholars and to make their academic journey more, yeah, more joyful and more easy. And what also we as um, non hearing impaired people can contribute to make that happen. So welcome again, Joyce. Thank you for joining us. Asante Sana. Thank you so much. Um, so yeah, to get started, would you like to tell us a little bit where your interest is coming from? How did uh, how did you get into the topic of mental health or psychology studies in general? And then later on, if you could explain your experiences with deaf people and why that led now to your research focus and your professional focus in consulting in these areas. Oh, thank you so much for the question. So growing up, I was in a family of healers and teachers and preachers and medicine oh. men. And therefore I realized that my family had a big influence on who I became. As a little girl, a lot of times my parents and siblings noticed that I was compassionate and I had all these ideas around justice, equality, fairness and compassion and out of these things um my mother thought that i was going to become a medical doctor mm -hmm. but my father thought i was more like a vet because i also really like pet animals yeah. um i actually defied both of those uh two early on ideas and went ahead and i'm working with human beings but a lot in the capacity like that of a doctor or a vet would do <laughs> So I find that healing is a strength or a value that, you know, just came down my family, but it was also based on needs that I saw in my family and community and trying to transform those things. Uh, one beauty about the profession of psychology is I get to work on my own personal uh, needs, problems, concerns as I go ahead with helping other people around the world. So. I like the profession because of that sense of personal fulfillment that you can actually work on yourself as you also, you know, ensuring the well being of others. So, you know, psychology is the study of the brain and human behavior. And I was fascinated by all the things going on around me in my community, in my family, and in myself. So, I wanted a way, um, a framework to understand how to better support people who have psychological or emotional problems. And so I got here. And of course, after 15, now going on to 16 years of lots of hard work and study, I'm happy that I'm now able to see that the more you know, the, the less you know. You know what I mean? The irony of <laughs> the more of you know, course. the more you know that you don't know. <laughs> uh -huh. And um, but I basically work in the field of mental health, as you said, and which you know is about people's condition with regard to their psychological and emotional well-being. That's my mainstay profession. I'm also very much inside of research work, which has to do with you know finding out things and how to do things better. And so I find that my mental health career as well as my uh, research career go in tandem they go hand in hand and I'm able to make a contribution uh, in both of these fields at the same time yeah and your research career was also on topic isn't it so yes so that makes a lot of sense and the two like you might think that self-care and also 
psychology as a profession and then the research on psychology well can be disconnected but they are very much also intertwined um how did was did you feel that there was a mismatch in the way research sometimes approach, approaches um human brain matters or mental health matters in the sense of that it seems too technical or was it all inclusive also of the ideas that were transferred to you by your family and by your and like ancestors at large yeah. like what you learned in a in the community context that's a very brilliant question um unfortunately the curriculum on mental health across the world has been quite white over the years mm -hmm. in other words there's not been enough contribution from a cultural perspective. And yes, I would say that that's a gap. Currently, psychology does not even go into spirituality, which we know is also another dimension of being human. Uh, I mean, we delve into thoughts and feelings and behaviors pretty much, but maybe a little into body sensations, which we are now finding is a big deal. We now have to really go into what's going on somatically in the body as well as spiritually in order to totally understand the human being. So there were gaps in the curriculum, which actually resulted in me joining a movement of Africans who are inside of our profession of mm -hmm. mental health. And we are now trying to relook uh, under the chapter that I lead called Forum of African Psychology, we are trying to relook what what is it that we miss. There's a saying from West Africa, a Sankofa proverb that says that it is not wrong to go back for that which you forgot. Mm. So we are going back into our roots to see that which we forgot. That actually has made our social fabric disintegrate. Uh, a lot of cultural um, um, mixing that has happened because of influences of colonialism, but also a lot of it because of generational shifts, you know, with globalization and movement of people, we find that a lot of people actually are not aware of what contributions their heritage bring to the table. And so a lot of it is currently imported and we are working working on that under that platform that I mentioned, the Forum of African Psychology, we are working to recenter our own theories and ways of thinking about mental health that are more customized to our uniquely um, diverse communities. Well, that's, yeah, that's really uplifting and encouraging to hear because as much as I think it also makes sense to streamline certain disciplines and research, but also, I think any research topic has a very distinct local and regional context that cannot yeah. be or shouldn't be overlooked. Otherwise, we miss a lot of information. Would you, would you be, like, would you want to share like one example of how traditional or a community knowledge can inform psychological yeah. research? Yeah, one of the very profound um, cultural phenomenon in our side of the world is during loss, grief, bereavement, and death. And our communities excel in the fields of, you know, uh, acceptance, letting go, and coming together as a community. If I have a death in my family, my entire extended family will troop in basically. Mm. And I will not have to worry about um, uh, logistics on burial costs and things like that. It's a very big community strength. We may not be um, very well equipped in, for instance, people who have terminal illnesses like cancer doing diagnosis and testing. That may be a gap in our communities, but in terms of late stage care, palliative care, we excel in that space. Mm. However, mainstream psychology has been quite individualistic and has not focused on what role the communities play in mental well-being. Mm. I actually remember when I've had like really uh, close people to me die, I've remembered that it was because of the contribution of other people into my life that the stress levels could be managed and mm. I could realize, you know, uh, better abilities to cope with our loss and 
you know, to still be a contribution in, in my community, even uh, with very devastating news. So there's an aspect of our communal well-being that seems to be relegated in favor of a more individualistic view of how to just mm. on my own, you know, fix my thoughts and <laughs> feelings that individualistic versus uh, collective uh, way of looking at things is actually something that needs to be um, researched and highlighted more in our setting. Yeah, and encouraged that it's okay to ask for help. And also, what I feel also in my own experience, when despite my willingness to be of support, like in a Western context or in my context of Germany, when I hear that a close one of a friend dies, we seem to be paralyzed and not knowing how we should react. And the simplest thing that's of need is just to reach out and say, hey, I'm here for you. Let me know if you need anything. I can help you get the necess necessities and organizing the burial fixed, or yeah. you can cry on my shoulder or anything like that. But most people seem to shy away because the like death, which is inevitable, will come to us to our families no matter what, sooner or later. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, we have right. unlearned to trust in the community for all the individualism, as you said. That's, that's also what I experienced um, during my visits to various African countries and cities, that the community support is still very much alive. I think you can also see it like in the bigger cities, there, mm -hmm. you see that there's a competitive com competitiveness as well. And in terms of, I mean, yeah, this, this is probably going too far also on assumptions, for this conversation to have, but it's an interesting observation to make. And thanks for pointing this out. Yeah, I think humans are social animals. We need our communities, no matter what. And, and I agree, it could be a broad generalization and there are definitely many incidences and instances of individualism in our centers. As I said, with globalization, there's been a lot of uh, movement and mixing of cultures, but I would say, to a large extent, yes, uh, we do have a lot of phenomenon in our settings that are not in the mainstream research in my field. So that's one of them. And it's a point of like, we need to go and look into it more. Yeah. Yeah. Not to, yeah thanks for bringing us back to, for the research aspect, not to look at the individual, how's the individual coping, but what community context does the individual live in? And is right. there anyone who's actually in, has a capacity to support that person and how is that happening? Mm -hmm. And I think that's when the community effect is kicking in. And, and also like, I, in my experience, like mental health issues, I think are quite normal for people to experience. Mm -hmm. The question is, is there a support system in place to mitigate the effects of these issues? It's basically yeah. a coping mechanism and it's okay to mm -hmm. grieve and to be under pressure for some time and then to draw back and um, and sometimes our bodies force us to in terms of depression mm -hmm. they force us right. to 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 calm down for mm -hmm. some days some weeks some months in some cases but yeah. then if individuals are being left to themselves that's when the issue starts really right mm -hmm. um, yeah would you You've looked a lot from what I've seen and heard of you into mental health issues inside the academic system. Could you say yes. a few words around that, what you've observed and where you see we can right. be better as scholars with each other? And yeah. Where we treat each other? So, yeah, a definition is a good place to start. Um, mental health is misunderstood and many people associate it with mental institutions unfortunately but actually mental health just refers to our well-being how we are coping uh, emotionally psychologically and cognitively and there's a high pressure environment in academia generally speaking this could be across the globe and in many settings but there are also contextual factors that make it particularly difficult for certain groups of people to go through academia 
people who are differently able though with different disabilities uh there are gender differences there's quite a number of pressures that affect people differently at different stages of for instance the research journey and in academia well-being is also relegated to something not so important and when people are talking about making a contribution in academia they will do it at all costs i mean students know to not sleep it's a common practice across the world before an exam while well, actually sleep is the most important thing you need in order to have good memory of all the things that you need to pass your tests the following day so as i said earlier um, academia is a high pressure environment and in a high performance environment you have got to have the mind like that of an athlete now kenya is a great athletics country we have quite a number of long distance runners and now a few upcoming short distance runners too. But we know that what you take to a marathon is not the same thing you take to a sprint. Mm. And what I'm talking about here is um, aspects of coping over the long haul. And many students will enter a postgraduate program with a more um, fantastical or Pollyanna uh, idea of what it will be like, but may not be with the reality of what it really entails to be inside of a postgraduate program. And so they are met with a high performance environment. They may not be ready for the yeah. rigorous, demanding day to day tasks of completing assignments and handling them in good time and with high grades, you know, doing them well, basically. Mm -hmm. And aside from that, there's other things that impact day to day living that have nothing to do with school, such as, you know, family life and social life and these different um, scenarios could create some conditions in uh, some students such as stress, which may impair functioning, you know, uh, affect relationship with people. I remember during the middle of my doctorate i asked myself whether i had a social life it did not occur that i have one i tried to recall if i have any friends and <laughs> i could not recall for a moment you know whether i had any because you know the demands of just being in school itself were quite heavy and i had to also balance that with uh work now if somebody does not have any outlets for relaxation rest rejuvenation then it becomes quite um, a high strung affair and most people will drop out there has been high attrition rates out of the higher degrees for instance doctorate degrees have quite uh, considerable attrition rates because of these uh, factors of well-being that are actually not intervened for most universities have a counseling center but most students will not connect that they may need to speak to somebody in order to perform better at school they'll probably misunderstand the the you know you know the reasons the causes and what they need to do as just a matter of willpower you know if i just if i just decide i should just do it but they may not realize that actually it's a lot and they and when you have more load to carry you actually may need more support and it's okay to ask for help you know as you said earlier so i would say the other dimension of academia is there's quite a lot of toxicity. I think there has been um, big, big um, championing for the publish or perish. And that phenomenon is good in as far as productivity is concerned, but may not always work for everybody at every stage. And so the publish or perish is this phenomenon in academia that you always have to be highly productive. You always have to produce papers. And if you don't, then you do not get uh, uh, promotions, job, um, you know, uh, maybe pay rise in your job and things like that. And so people are actually really stressed just trying to meet the metrics in order to um, maintain their tenure. For instance, those who are scholars and teaching in the academic institutions. Mm -hmm. And now with COVID, of course, everything upturned and um, there's been quite a heavy load. I mean, we just a few weeks ago, we welcomed 2022 with the hopes of putting COVID-19 behind us, but there's still rocketing cases of uh, uh, case numbers are rising and there's a lot of tension, anxiety and fear and there's a re-entry, there's always an in and out of activities in academia 
uh, which is making it more difficult. In other words, we are moving from a pandemic to an endemic situation, you know. I mean, everybody knows now words like lockdown and things like that. And, you know, there's been a lot of cancellations and postponements. So there's just been a whole upheaval. And uh, there's a change definitely in how we are functioning. And you see, we are now re-entering uh, into academia in the light in light of all the above, what I just spoke about. So what I could urge everyone is to continue taking care of your mental health and of those around you. You know, it's very important for us to tend to our well-being now, mm -hmm. just as it was during the peak of the pandemic. You know, then we also have to really, really look things like professional and social boundaries, because we've now all trooped into the online space there's been an increase in online activities and now we've got to negotiate for work hours and also how much contact we have and based on what we perceive ours, as our health risks or the health risk of other people you know so now we even have to kind of think about how many days per week do i need to work from home or work from the office and there's a lot of anxiety about who are the people who are still alive okay let's first of all look around who's still here you know there's that you know we don't know who's there are we going to be in the same class with the same students or how will we get along now mm -hmm. after all the deaths around us then i think also spaces for voicing these anxieties are not enough so students or learners or anybody going through academia now has to ensure that they create for themselves the opportunity to assess whether they may need some extra support and where they may need to go and just talk, you know. And some people are, are venting on social media, but venting we know is not therapy. And venting is good, it has its function. Mm. But, you know, people Maybe are seeking in public, help. In right. Maybe right, right, right. There's a lot of yes now there's a lot of hashtags like toxic academia and COVID this COVID that but you know people are seeking help in whichever way that seems beneficial to them mm -hmm. uh, whether it's a professional community service friends family even anonymous helplines are now jammed um for instance in kenya the government set up um helplines recently actually there's been an increase of those mm -hmm. and we know that there is an uncertainty that covid has impacted in many many aspects of our lives so wow. that's like the most recent thing but academia in itself has always been quite protectionist and quite toxic in that sense of uh, requiring productivity above humanity and so there's a shift there's we need to turn the tide and one of the things i do is i train uh, people in academia, I do lots and lots of webinars, I'll share some links later mm. on how we can move from linear time to non-linear time where you can actually give yourself a break because even sometimes when we give people an off and they should go on vacation, they actually do not rest, they're still on, you see, you can be on vacation and you're still, um, you know, but there has to be spaces where people actually uh, get unhooked and just relax and people doing their best is when they are at their most relaxed and in their you know in their best element when they're actually feeling good if they're feeling great then they will actually perform so uh this kind of spaces that we are now creating are spaces that, that are interinstitutional that's a new dimension too mm -hmm. Right. So now students from different um, institutions across the globe are meeting in their hundreds and thousands. So there's a new crowd, there's a new community there uh, where people can begin to speak about there's a, there's a beauty and an advantage of that because people can begin to see the similarity that it's not something personal or it's not in your department only or in your school <laughs> only or your university, you know. As something in academia that we all need to look at, uh, which is that toxic academic space. Right. So to nail it down, so the toxicity, you you briefly touched on the publisher parish syndrome. Mm -hmm. And that right. in my observation, or in, I mean the term is also was coined by others, has turned into a publish and parish. Um, mm -hmm. syndrome really <laughs> so it doesn't really matter how much and how often and where you publish, you might still perish unless you keep a constant flow of communicating about your research one way or the other. Right. 
But as you like, we like with access to perspectives have specialized in open science, which mm -hmm. I believe personally can bring bring back joy and also mitigate or even prevent many of the mental health issues that we describe and observe, in the sense mm -hmm. that it's more collaborative rather than competitive. Share your results and your research. Uh, achievements early in the process and not wait don't wait until instead of working waiting until you you publish a um, a research article three years after you started your graduation process or longer because some some topics just or some research projects just take their time to get to completion um so yeah there's a whole lot of um factors that go into that equation but I personally believe and I've also observed that working in an open science way is more fun and is more productive and more efficient. And it doesn't mean that everything that we do has to be put on online, any point of your, the pro process really, but it's a way to approach our own research and to find allies and supporters and partners for the projects and to communicate about it in a, reasonable and feasible open way yeah also purpose-driven also um solution-oriented and and also exchanging about the hurdles and barriers and bottlenecks that we experience in terms of methodology or research equipment that we have or don't have and then it will be easy to find ways to mitigate or to circumvent the challenges for everybody and everybody wins. Mm -hmm. It's of course easier said than done, but that's what we do yes. with access to perspectives to some degree. Um, mm -hmm. And now- I, I really like that you've introduced uh, the concept of open science and the idea that we can all begin to look in a solution oriented way, mm -hmm. you know, in a purpose driven way I think that for me points to solidarity. So yeah. in a sense, we can even begin to create intercontinental types of research like we did the other day, you know, with a huge workshop where we had researchers all across Africa mm. doing a peer review on a single paper at the same time. It was so exciting, that live interaction on Zoom. I think with technology, we now have quite quite a good platform to be responsive to each other, which actually improves our research capabilities together. So I like that. Yeah. I would say that to, to say more on the toxicity, aside from publish or perish, from the perspective of students, if I could summarize all what um, the toxicity is about, it's about minimal support. So yeah. a typical postgraduate student in my setting will actually not receive adequate supervision. They'll be very lucky if they get a supervisor who has integrity enough to actually uh, design timelines and meet the timelines. But you'll find that students are thrown into the world of research with an assumption that they have the foundational knowledge, which in most cases, there are major gaps because the training of researchers by the people training actually has gaps. And then throughout the process of supervision, there are two main problems, the systemic overload. So you'll find that professors do not have enough time to actually spend with students because they are also just trying to get through loads and loads of marking. They're dealing with classes of 500 plus students, basically capacity short, shortages in the system. So I would say that that's one. And the other one is individual factors. Students coming in, like I said earlier, with different um, you know, predispositions are likely to be stressed in di at different times by different things. And these individual factors may or may not have anything to do with the academic environment. And so throughout the supervision journey, they'll say, I did not get enough supervision, just enough structure to support me. And when I needed somebody to just to show me uh, a set of options, so I pick one, I did not get that. So many students will experience being alone and it's quite a lonely journey trying to uh, create a collaborative research project of which when um, the supervisors are supposed to endorse it, they may most likely come and actually um, decline to endorse it 
And therefore the student is left bewildered like, oh, I thought you were supposed to assist me on my side. And now you're saying I should basically start all over again. And so mm -hmm. I think supervisors may need a lot more support to also be supportive and how to give yeah. feedback and, and to also use some mentorship skills. So that creates a lot of toxicity on the part of students and the, what they experience in a nutshell is minimal support. Yeah, so our exactly. Team, I, think, uh, sorry, I, I just need to inter not intervene, but yeah, I want to add to what you just said. And in my observation, it's also that the supervisors and PIs are often also overloaded with their own workloads yes. and yes. simply don't have the capacity and or the awareness. I mean, mm -hmm. it's either or or both. Um, yeah that mentorship requires more than just being present for certain times mm -hmm. in the week or on the day it's actually a right. skill that you can also learn yeah. if you're not sure yeah. how to go about it and but then yeah. the pace of of workload or the, the expectations that that accumulate as you move up your career ladder as a researcher and then eventually uh, be, yeah, be a supervisor to one or two or several PhD students and master students and technicians. It's a lot of responsibility. Many scholars have never mm -hmm. learned how to handle. And, mm -hmm. and I think it would be maybe that's also something that we can collect as a scholarly community mm -hmm. and a management level to, to mm -hmm. deliver, to provide resources. And you mentioned mentorship guidelines that everybody right. can embrace and look at and see how they can implement it in their routines to be good leaders and good supervisors mm -hmm. and be approachable and yeah. supportive of their students mm -hmm. have you yeah, seen i think and, some sorry mm -hmm. there, there are definitely good that they're what you would call the poster child of supervisors they're definitely great supervisors mm -hmm. i've been lucky to have you know some of the best and i would say it's good to to also look at the supervisor as you've said as an aspiring scholar they are also trying to make do with whatever capacity shortages are in our universities and they're trying to write and they're trying to publish and teach and they sometimes some faculty also have another responsibility like community service so they attend lots of administrative meetings so it's a lot to juggle but that actually still has no integrity when it comes to you know <laughs> supervision needs and and some people will distinguish supervision from mentorship as two separate and distinct yeah. fields but i would say a lot of mentorship skills can greatly assist you know supervisors in order to have them have a more humane you know interface with students and mm -hmm. for students to actually feel like they be that that the supervisor believes in them we've had I've had quite a number of extreme um, instances that have been very devastating of students trying to get the attention of the supervisor and having to pay for flights and run around to where the supervisor is, for instance, at a conferences and things like that, and accost the supervisor and confront the supervisor, you know, that is really, really sad. I've also had um, quite a number of cases of students who are suicidal because oh. they feel, oh. yeah, they feel trapped between a rock and a hard place. They've tried everything. Um, you know, I've received calls from hotel rooms from students who are running after their supervisors. And I'm not sure that supervisors really get the impact of, you know, the, their position of power on a student who's doing everything to survive, to also, you know, graduate. And they probably have paid up, you know, with their last penny. Students are always broke, you know, <laughs> and they're trying just trying to get to, you know, to the end of their program. So I've, I've intervened in suicidal cases. Those are some of the extreme cases. And uh, overall, I would say it results to quite a lot of trauma in students when students cannot get good audience and everything um, comes down to the department level. So if they try to um, report it to a higher office, like the dean or the vice chancellor or the chancellor's office, they are sent back to the department. And it could be that at the department level is where you know everybody is really overwhelmed and um, there is no audience. So basically, the student is left with no other option other than you know to go outside of the university and get 
pay somebody to write for them. Now that's a very unethical practice, but I've found that uh, a lot of students in our setting who are, you know, quite um, disenfranchised, they decide to do that. And um, in my mentorship, I have to be very, very clear that I do not engage in that practice of mm. writing research for other people but currently in this setting it is seen as the only mentorship that's useful <laughs> yeah. but that is not it's actually not true and uh, that is quite erroneous because uh, aside from paying somebody to do your work you are breaching copyright as well as uh, it's plain stealing it's plain plagiarism somebody else is doing your work for you so we have to deal with students who are coming from a very broken place and they may not even know that all that can result to trauma or that they could be facing trauma themselves so that's the thing sometimes we also really just have to bring it to their awareness that potentially these are trauma reactions like if a student says i'm having nightmares i cannot sleep we really have to get them to see that they now need to get you know uh to to look at their well-being and to begin to drop some of the unhealthy coping strategies, you know, they've done. And that is quite some work to undo the toxicity it takes a whole bunch of work. We have to think about how students can begin to advocate for their own, uh, you know, um, space and so that they can progress. I've seen students recently requesting their universities to have maybe professors from different universities if there is a capacity shortage at their university. And that has been a healthy way to cope with, you know, the capacity shortages in the system. Mm. And that also helps them to, to cope better. So for me, I look at it as systemic as well as individual factors, but all coming together. And currently there is a crisis in our, especially mm. postgraduate research program. Yeah. So um, maybe to have a, have a circle, circle or to close the circle towards the end of the conversation, what would you recommend scholars that find themselves in a crisis should do as a first aid or first self-aid mm -hmm. um, strategy to get out of that trap? Is there like yeah, so, steps they can mm -hmm. take which don't feel so yeah. overwhelming and vulnerable yeah. that they can take to, to ease their situation? I would say the ABCs, A for awareness, mm -hmm. B for balance, and C for connect. I think the first thing is to actually con be aware of what's going on. Get, get to learn, get online. If you get online, there's now millions of resources on mental health in academia, and you're not alone. So just to understand that tension, anxiety, and fear is part of the process of being in a high performance environment. And you're like an athlete in a race. And yes, there is a time limit and there is performance standards. And so all of that is really, really um, anxiety provoking. That is the first step. Once you are, are aware of the situation, then you are more readily uh, going to accept what you can do about it. And then two is balance. I would say, um, as I said earlier, considering professional and social boundaries, who do you need to put up a wall <laughs> against and who do you need to open a door for, you know, and seeing a friend once a week, even doing a phone call for 10 minutes, it, it really balances out, mm -hmm. you know, all the negativity that uh, can be building up inside of your academic journey. And then I would say number uh, four C is connect. It's really encouraging to see people connecting with strangers, potentially strangers online, but being in open communication with a trusted friend really has been found to work. So it's just about identifying how you can use your wisdom in order to, you know, connect and communicate. And I found that in a few instances in my own journey, when I was not able to be in contact with my supervisors, when I connected with the right people, they were able to even help me reframe a lot of the concerns I had so that when I eventually went back to my university, I was actually um, uh, leading conversations in a constructive way, you know, in order to create solutions. So. Everybody needs support, you know, and it's okay to ask for help. I would say that it is very beneficial for you to seek a professional, <clears throat> you know, if you would like 
uh, you know, to really delve into what's going on. And you see the beauty about a professional is that they are balanced and quite anonymous in the sense that they don't know you personally so that they can have an objective view of what's going on and potential strategies that you could try uh you know like tricks of the trade and tips and tools and and therefore if you inserted some of the new strategies in your routine then you'll fare better and you'll uh succeed um i think we can stem the tide of of, of the attrition's and the poor quality and the toxicity in academia, as well as those bad unethical practices. If we all play our part, you know, by protecting ourselves and others in the ways we do best, as we've continued to do, you know, protecting your own well being by knowing what you're supposed to do at what time, you know, that awareness, and then creating that balance. And then, of course, be in communication. Um, so the ABC is awareness, balance, and connect, connect, connect. <laughs> yeah, no, that's very good. And also it brings us back to what we talked about at the beginning of this episode, that we are social animals. So we need yeah. our peers, we need other people in our lives. We cannot mm -hmm. work in an isolated setting, which academia sometimes tricks us into. We need right. to be in connection with other mm -hmm. scholars. And if... Yeah the people in our research team and the supervisor are not available because they have their own struggles, we can still reach out to other people through open science mm -hmm. practices, by joining communities, by seeking professional help. And that's not, well, that's sometimes consider, um, or that sometimes people who know they need help feel ashamed in seeking that help, but it's actually a strength. And like you said, being aware of the deficiency you're currently experiencing, it's not your fault. And it's not our fault, but there's professionals who have these professions in order to help us get out of it. So it's a strength to take up that opportunity and to reach out to experts who can help us get on track again. And again, like the community factor. And thank you so much for this conversation. I think we touched on uh, quite a variety of topics that we can yeah. very much also dive deeper into in future episodes. Um, mm -hmm. We work together also in in a setting through Africa Archive and in collaboration with Ada Africa, where you also mentor um, yeah. in a community that helps scholars to to look at their writing skills, scientific writing skills, and also peer support and. Um, really astonished and, and amazed and happy about the work that you do also with Aurelia, your colleague and the director of Ada Africa and other people on the team. So we're very, very much looking forward to hearing more about that, where we're also together with Aurelia and more about your work. And um, as we said also in the beginning, you have a focus also on working with deaf people, especially in yeah. academia and also other work contexts. And you are very passionate about inclusive environments and professional settings in society. And yeah, and I think that will be excellent to have the opportunity to look into these um, topics that you've specialized in. Thank you so yeah, much. Sure. Thank you. Can I say one last word? Of course, what, or several. Yeah, what institutions can do. So, you know, at Ada Africa, we develop a, a responsive online and offline research mentorship programs for researchers in Kenya and Africa, and it's now gotten global. Um, okay. And by so doing, we are bringing together researchers. I would really like to urge institutions, be it universities at the department level, as well as uh, other research institutions to create spaces for students to talk in a more informal setting. That way that students can begin to find solutions for what's going on. Mm -hmm. I feel like empowering the student will be one um, major way that we can turn the tide on um, mental health struggles in academia. But the other way would be to also work with you know providers of academia such as professors research leaders research mentors aspiring scholars you know mm -hmm. uh, faculty lecturers these transformations that are taking place in africa today we cannot uh, leave these people behind because we you know take a lot from them uh, and their knowledge and their wisdom is important so how to shift around the contemporary academic landscape will depend on how we can overcome 
you know, the system, ourselves, all of us, every person, they are part to play. But I think that's the most major gap, I would say, our institutions do not have spaces for people to just talk, to just talk about the entire experience. And, you know, I know some universities in the world where people even have a 360 degree evaluation of their entire experience, because going to postgraduate school is an experience. So mm -hmm. I think that institutions need to come up with that. Yeah, and it's great to hear that you're leading by example. We will put the links for your listeners into the show notes and um, yeah, give references uh, for further investigation by you. And um, can we also leave a contact or can can people are interested to learn sure. more about the work of Ada Africa, maybe email the organization? Yeah, sure. So adaafricalimited.org is the um, website and I'll send you all of this. Um, E-I-D-E-R, that's the spelling. Yeah. So it's oh, adaafricalimited.org. Thank you. So you will have the link in the description for this episode and be free to reach out to us and um, Magari directly to learn more. And yeah, if you have any questions about today's topics, yeah, just reach out and we are happy to answer anything. Thank you so much and speak to you soon. Thank you. It was a pleasure. For Haley. The pressure is all mine. An hour. Bye. Thank you. <laughs> all right.